Hello, my name is Sean Conley. I'm a state soybean and small grain specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In part two of the soybean growth and development, I want to spend this time focusing on early season growth and development for what we call the vegetative growth stages of soybean. For a good resource or guide to move forward, please identify and look for Iowa State Extension Publication PM1945 titled Soybean Growth and Development. The first question I usually get from, from growers and crop consult consultants is, why should I spend the time to learn how to grow stage a crop? For realistically, what we really understand is why we need to understand these growth stages can really help you as a grower, as a crop consultant, more timely and efficiently uh, time your applications for different production practices, really trying to push some of these higher yields, specifically for trying to identify the planting times, earn in-season diagnosis based on crop growth stage, herb uh, herbicide or fertilizer, fungicide and insecticide labels, as well as the proper harvest timing. So throughout this early growth and development staging seminar, I really want to focus on some specific uh, agronomic characteristics and timings that you can apply based on that crop growth stage. And what really helps us to do is help to interpret, interpret what you're seeing in the field. And overall, what we're trying to do is over, overall increase your profitability. So in this first session, we'll be talking about the vegetative growth stages, otherwise known as the V stages of soybean growth and development. Before we get going into this, I want to remind people of what some of the characteristics they need to look at. I want to note on this on this figure right here what some of the note of these growing points are. When we start talking about nodes and growing points, these would be the axillary buds here at the cotyledons, the unifoliates, and the first trifoliate, as well as the primary growing point known as axillary marista. So those are some key characteristics being able to identify what growth stage you are and how to count these nodes as we move forward, as these leaves open, and as we move through the vegetative crop growth staging. The first thing we have to look at is soybean germination. Again, the soybean germination process can take anywhere from three days up to three weeks based on soil temperature, soil moisture conditions. So after we actually place that seed in the soil surface. We begin this, the germination process where we Im imbi imbibe water. The first structure that you will see coming out of the soybean seed would be a radical or the root, followed then by the hypocotyl. If we look at soybean growth and development, there's not a lot of very good predictive models out there. Most agronomists just use the base 50 degrees Fahrenheit temperature that they use for field corn. Uh, however, realistically, if you look at the literature, I would say the base temperature for soybean growth and development, especially in the germination phase, is somewhere less than 50 in that 45 to 48 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, what that really tells us is that you can put soybeans out there in a little bit cooler uh, soil conditions and get germination and emergence before that you would see that with field corn. One of the interesting things of when I've surveyed growers across the country is only 46% of soybean farmers plant soybeans in the recommended seeding depth range of, of three quarters of an inch to an inch and a half. Again, that tells us that 54% of growers are either planting their soybeans too shallow or too deep. And again, some of the characteristics that can really come into that are emergence, emergence issues as well as variable germination based on soil water capacity and the amount of moisture available to, for those soybean seeds in by water. If we look at how long it takes on average for a soybean seed to emerge, again, it's somewhere in that 5 to 14 days. And what most growers will see is that in some years we need to go out and really check that to make sure we're not having issues, which I'll show shortly. And you may need to hit that soybean field with a rotary hoe to assess what kind of stress that plant is going in due to um, that soil being sealed through heavy rains or compaction due to rainfall characteristics. This is one of the characteristics you can see of following, especially in a clean field with a high clay uh, content, we can see the soil being sealed and soybeans having a difficult time emerging through this layer of crust. And what we can see is that neck here and where that hypocotyl is beginning to emerge and push itself through that crust will actually break that stem. Once that hypocotyl is broken, that plant is effectively uh, dead. It will not uh, be able to to grow because we don't have any of the meristems 
for that so for that soybean plant to continue growth. After we get the plant out of the ground, the first true leaves are known as the VC or the cotyledon growth stage. These are identified here with these unifoliates that are placed opposite to one another, and then you can see that they're just one single leaf on this growth stage. At the VC growth stage, that is generally when growers, uh, crop consultants, get a chance to go out there and be able to take stand counts. One of the main questions we get from growers is what is the optimal seeding rate and when should I start replanting or thinking about filling in these stands if I've got suboptimal stands due to soil crusting or other issues related to germination and emergence. Our data is pretty clear here showing that as long as we have 100,000 plants up at this VC and up through harvest time, we can maximize our soybean yield. However, one of the interesting things that we can see is even if we drop our soybean stands considerably down to 60,000 or less than 40,000 plants per acre, we still see a relatively good yield. Again, obviously we're not up in that 63 to 64 bushels per acre at our maximum stand. We've taken a substantial hit, but this gives us a sense of the plasticity of that soybean plant and how well it can respond to these thinner plant stands. Now, when you go out there to make these assessments, what I always encourage growers to do and crop consultants is that as long as you have 50,000 plants per acre out there at that VC growth stage, do not touch that soybean field at all. Do not go in and try and uh, retill it and start a new stand, or don't go in and try and interfill or interseed across that existing sand with new seed. Data here is pretty con conclusive, saying as long as we have 60,000 plants or more, it really does not benefit us to be able to add more seed into that existing stand. However, once we get below 40,000, this data here clearly shows at that point, growers can effectively interseed or put new seed back into that lower plant population and still economically maximize, e ex maximize yield given the, the restraints they had with that initial seeding. Under no circumstance do we encourage growers to go out regardless of what that stand is hit it with a field cultivator and restart their, their seeding process from scratch. The main reason for that is you, A, you first of all have to increase your seeding rate. Here we've dropped 220,000 seeds per acre and we still have a significant yield loss compared to if we were to drop say 120 or 140 earlier. And, and primarily the reason for that is that we had such a huge planting date effect that growers are taking significant yield loss. Because if you look across the state of Wisconsin after about May 10th, we tend to see four tenths of a bushel per acre per day yield loss. So what does that equate to a grower? So if you are not able to get your soybeans planted prior to, to uh, May 10th, you get in there on say May 20th, you've lost four bushels. If you delay to May 30th, you're down eight bushels per acre. So it gives us a sense of that the, the need for growers in the northern part of the soybean belt, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, really get out there and if the soil is, is in good working conditions and it's not wet or saturated, to get those soybeans in as early as possible in order to maximize their yield and productivity. Now once we get into the V1 stage, this is when we identify the first trifoliate. This is when we have one node above the unifoliate leaves. And this is where the trifoliates are produced from this point forward. As you can see, it's a trifoliate because there are three leaflets attached to that uh, petiolio that's attached to that node. Next growth stage is V2 where we have two trifoliates and this is a growth stage where the nodules are beginning to be established. Uh, this is a growth time, growth stage timing where growers, crop cons consultants can go out there and start digging their plant roots carefully and checking to see if proper nodulation has occurred. So for those of you unfamiliar, uh, soybean no nodulation is a symbiotic relationship uh, where we have either native or introduced bacteria that in effect and pr perform a symbiotic relationship where the bacteria will provide the soybean with the nitrogen needed to grow and in return the plant produces and provides the, um, the rhizobia with the sugar, the, the carbohydrates in order for them to grow. So it's kind of a win-win situation for both of these um, spe or for both the rhizobia and the plant species as well. 
maximum of good soybean nodulation is necessary for high yields, but you have to be careful also because there are some chemicals and many weather conditions that can really affect this bacteria health and if you have that good nodulation early, uh, which is that V2 growth stage. So a soybean plant requires a tremendous amount of nitrogen, which it requires from two different sources. If you look at the protein production required for the nitrogen, is it's N times 6.25, which equals that protein content. So if you take that into the next example, a 50 bushel per acre soybean crop at 38% protein requires 180 pounds of nitrogen for that seed protein alone. About 50% of the nitrogen comes from the nodules, and the other 50% comes from uh, soil nitrate uh, or other forms of N fixation. So there has been some data suggest a small amount of N may increase yields in certain high yielding environments. However, much of the data that we see here in Wisconsin often shows that um, the addition of nitrogen into a soybean management system really does not pay off beneficially to towards the grower's bottom line. Following the V2 growth stage, we have the V3 growth stage. At this point, we start to see the cotyledons, uh, have, which were the primary source of nutrition to get that soybean plant up and growing and through the V2 growth stage, have basically sloughed off that plant. And these cotyledons are gone, and the ox axillary buds then can allow these plants to continue to regrow following any type of mechanical or um, plant damage. This is also the optimal time where growers need to be thinking about going out and making a glyphosate or a weed control strategy application somewhere between this V2 and V3 growth stage. If you can go through and look at uh, the UW Extension publication A3646 that goes into in-depth uh, recommendations based on plant management or as well as pest management recommendations across all the Wisconsin field crops. But if we want to briefly get into this, what we can really see is this nitrogen, or excuse me, we can briefly see is this soybean yield loss is influenced by the timing of weed removal and crop row spacing. Here's what I mean by that. So you look at the blue line right here, this would be a 7.5 inch row spacing or really narrow row spacing. The pink is 15 inch row spacing and the yellow is a 30% or 30 inch row spacing. So if we're able to go through and do this timing, at a V2 growth stage, we could really see we're less than 5% of a, of a yield loss on 7.5s, but at 15s or 30s, we start seeing significant yield losses. One of the challenges we see is growers trying to get by with a, with a single application of one mode of action late in the season, so that would say be a V5 application timing. At that time, we see anywhere from a 9% all the way up to a 17% yield loss based on row spacing for yield loss due to early season weed competition. The challenge is growers, crop consultants can't always um, factor that in because they don't, they control their weeds and they don't know that they suffered that yield loss by waiting until that V5 growth stage to, to control their weed uh, species spectrum. So the point we're really trying to stress upon growers is really focus in here in this V2 to V3 crop growth stage if you have standing weeds in the field in order to uh, maximize your, your your yields as well as minimize that weed competition. One of the interesting things we can look at is some of this yield loss data that we've seen and this would be a typical V2 operation. Okay, if We went out and uh, did some plant stand counts for giant ragweed, common lamb scorters, giant foxtail, fact factoring in about a 50 bushel per acre soybean yield potential at a, a commodity price of $10.50 per bushel. If we can look at the yield loss that so we see just for moving from V2 to the V3 growth stage, we see a $13 penalty to growers by just waiting that one week in timing. And that's how critical that early season weed competition is by not going on and getting that application out there in a timely manner. So once this data was kind of put together, uh, Nathaniel Fickett and Dave Stoltenberg and Chris Borbrum went out and really tried to get an idea of walking into growers fields and trying to get an idea of what is this predicted yield loss across the state of Wisconsin. So they worked with growers and went identified uh, 30 soybean fields in 2008 and 40 soybean fields in 2009. They, they went through and, and sampled the weed species in this type of a pattern to really get a, a good sense of for these fields that 
have not been treated with a post-emergence herbicide? What kind of crop injury or damage are they getting to their bottom line? And in short, in 2008, we saw that first herbicide application not being applied until V4. Basically, they're losing 9.3% yield loss in those situations. In 2009, again, they were out there basically a week early, and they've lost substantially less yield loss. And at this point, there was basically down to 3.1% yield loss. What this really tells us is how quickly that soybean yield loss can increase just based on a simple uh, week or a few inches of weed growth in a given growing season. The last growth stage, vegetative growth stage, that we get into is known as the V6 growth stage. Uh, at this time, we can see new trifoliates put on every three days. And at this point, if we start seeing any type of defoliation, um, any type of crop injury due to herbicide application or drift, and a 50% yield loss at V6 leads to about a 3% yield loss at, at, the, at the bin when you go through and hit it with the harvesting. So again, just some simple ideas to understand that even at this early, at this late V stage, which would probably be in most situations across Wisconsin, that third week in June, we can still see some pretty substantial leaf loss and still get minimal yield loss based on the compensation ability of that soybean plant. For more information on soybean growth and development or other management char characteristics, please see my webpage, which is coolbean.info. Follow me on Twitter, at BadgerBean, or please contact your local extension agent. 